<laughs> so the question, the question is saying, what if a person uh, plans repentance later? So they say, you know what? Let me go to Vegas, and then inshallah I'll go to Hajj afterwards, right? And or people say, you know, college, they want to have the college experience, and then they want to make toba afterwards. And he says that is. That's the example of the brothers of Yusuf. They said, we're going to kill Yusuf, and then after that, we'll be from the righteous. But it didn't end up happening for uh, the children of Yusuf. And one thing that people have to always pay attention to is that usually sins lead to one another. It's never a one and done with regards to sin. And shaitan uses one sin to lead to the next, to lead to the, to the next. And so a person shouldn't play games with repentance. If a person commits a sin, then they should repent, but a person should never plan sin with the intention of repentance, because it doesn't work out like that normally. Wallah. Uh, yeah, I just want to add something. I always used to think about this, yeah, and if someone is planning something evil, he says, then I'll repent. And we said sincere repentance, you have to feel remorse. So how do you plan to really be hurt and feel remorse later on? How can you do that? You plan it and then, okay, Wednesday I'll make toba. Then Wednesday you wake up and you, and you get sad and, and cry. How? How do you plan it like that? It's just impossible. So how do you plan a sincere toba in advance and someone's planning to do something nasty already? It's really impossible. Yeah, um. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, this is one very uh, interesting that we uh, have been mentioned uh, before that uh, uh, our ability or the uh, person's ability uh, to have the uh, repentance is uh, one of the mercy of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, can you just uh, elaborate and explain more detail? Because is this uh, something that uh, uh, Allah has chosen somebody to be uh, get the uh, uh, repentance? And also, is that a kind of the, just like Allah give the hidayah to somebody? Is uh, it? So the question is basically, uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's like, can you elaborate with regards to Tawbah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who inspires Tawbah in That's the right. first place? Exactly. Just like with regards to hidayah, Allah is the one who guides. And so it's almost, I think, a question of, is it the, the, the chicken before the egg, right? Does a person repent because Allah inspired them to repent or do they repent of their own accord? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that you mentioned to I mean, is that, uh, yeah, I mean, we keep asking Allah and then uh, do repeating, repeating, as you mentioned before, like the, even the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do that a uh, hundred times a day. Okay, I, I'm still not 100% clear on the question, but uh, maybe this aspect of it. You know, if we saw repentance as a blessing and a gift from Allah Azza wa perhaps it will erase most of this question. Yani, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you to repentance is itself one of the greatest blessings. Allah, yani, I'll tell you. Um, again, I heard one da'i, he was speaking about how when you repent from a sin, that's in and of itself a blessing. And one of the most disastrous things is when you commit a sin and you're not even aware that it's a sin, so you never repent from it in your whole life. And he gave an example, he actually gave an example of those exercise programs where you know you, you play this DVD and you jump with them. Yeah. So he gave an example of one of them where he said people will be watching that and jumping with them and how, do, how are the women dressed on these DVDs, yeah? And how do they choose them to look uh, physically, face, hair? They choose attractive women. So for days you're jumping with these girls, huh? <laughs> and you never stop to say, okay, that's not right what I'm looking at, and you never repent from it. No. Yani, what a disaster to commit a sin and you never once guided or inspired to repent from it. So what if we looked at repentance as a great blessing. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one, allowed us, yani, created the idea of repenting, and two, guided us to repent to Him. So many people, unrepentant, have no remorse, no regrets, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens, opens your heart to that, that is what a believer is, right? 
That's why one time the Prophet wanted to say the word believer, but he didn't say the word. He just described whoever is pleased with his good deeds and is, يعني, is يعني, like is grieved. grieved, hurt, offended by his bad deeds. What a blessing that I have that feeling and I can go and rush and repent to Allah Azza wa And that's why there's nothing like guidance, nothing like guidance. And when you look at the verses of in Surah An-Nur specifically of guidance and the verses of misguidance, you see what an incredible blessing that is. And there's no analogy I have for that besides, it's not even a good analogy, but imagine there's a poor person outside of a huge supermarket. And the owner of the supermarket goes out to this poor person and gives him a lot of cash and tells him, go inside and buy whatever you want with this cash that I gave you to shop in my market. And then every time you shop, I will give you rewards and other free stuff for shopping in my store from the money that I gave you. This is our life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, it's probably still not a good analogy. But I ask Allah Azza wa for things, to do good things for Him so He can do good things for me. And Ya Allah, give me a million dollars, I'll build you a masjid. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me a million dollars so I can do something good for Him so He can reward me with it. What an incredible blessing that is. What generosity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what if we just took this angle of looking at being able to give tawbah, Allah guiding me to give tawbah as a form of, to make tawbah, and repent is a form of guidance, and it's a great blessing when Allah blesses you with the ability to make tawbah, and when Allah blesses you with being conscious that I need to make tawbah from this thing, or that thing. Wallah ta'ala alam, I don't know if that is what you were looking for. Allah you're, just, you're just nice because you're Indonesian, that's how it works. <laughs> Even if I'm 100% wrong, like, thank you so much. <laughs> I know you South Asian people, you're the sweetest people in the world. Thank you. I used to be honest. Is is that that a I love your kufiya. I like you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So istighfar is the act of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. It's the actual statement. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Sorry. The question is with regards to the difference between tawbah and istighfar. And istighfar is the act of seeking Allah's forgiveness by saying astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And tawbah is the comprehensive concept that we discussed, which is all of these aspects, the, the pillars that we discussed of remorse, as well as commitment to never commit the sin again, as well as actually being in a state of repentance, never actually committing the sin again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best. So that's the difference. Sometimes when we commit a sin, if we commit a sin to what Allah is easy for us, to ask repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes we are also uh, committed to sin to the grace of Allah. And then what we should do if we will never going to see, meet the discretion of Allah to ask forgiveness from them. And then the second one is uh, Satan always making us hesitate. When we ask repentance from Allah, we always create the problem, the hesitation was was for us, will Allah gonna accept my repentance or not? Always gonna like uh, to make us uh, like. And then the third one is. Can we just do them one by one? I'm sorry. <laughs> Can we just do them one by one? Okay. You what? Can we just do them one at a, one at a time? Yeah. Uh, sure. Just yes. because of the so the because I already forgot what the first one was. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the first the third one? one is, uh, <laughs> okay. So what is the sign that our Okay, very good. So the third one, uh, so the first one was, if you can just remind me of the first one, or do you remember what it was? I'm sorry. What was the first one? Against a human being. When we commit the sin. Against the human being? Okay. And we never sin again. We just, when we commit the uh, sin to the grace of Allah, we ask the benefit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also to the individual that we commit the uh, uh, sin. To yes. Him, right? So even we will never going to meet him again, what should we do? Okay, great. So if you are never, if you, for example, committed a sin against a person and you're never going to meet that person again and you're seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you then rectify it? 
So it's situational, it depends on what the circumstance is. So for example, if a person has taken money uh, from that person and then they do not have access to that individual for whatever reason. Say for example, the scholar said if the person passed away for example, mm -hmm. then you give that money to their inheritance. Mm -hmm. If um, you simply cannot find this person, you, you've searched for this person and searched for this person and searched for this person and there, there ends up being no way where you can actually find that person again, then you donate that money on that person's behalf. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward that person for that amount. If it is, for example, um, some sort of verbal abuse that you, you know, maybe you backbite it against that person. And they even give the example of, with regards to backbiting, if, if you even know that by telling that person and asking for forgiveness from that person, that you are going to actually ruin your relationship or it'll actually harm them even more by you mm -hmm. communicating with them. So mm -hmm. then what do you do? They said that you then, uh, in the same circles where you actually spoke ill of that person, that you then go and speak good of that person, that you undo what you did of harm mm -hmm. in the capacity that you are able to do. And so the, the answer is that it's circumstantial that you try to resolve it as best that you can. Allah. And if you don't know the exact amount of the, of the money, yeah, you don't know the amount, whether it was 10,000 or 10 million, you don't really remember. You try to estimate as best as you can, and you try to resolve it that way. Allah. The second question was with regards to? But this, uh, saying again, just to work clear, shaitan makes you uh, always doubt if your repentance was, was forgive, accepted or not. All right, two sides to this. <clears throat> One part of it is a good part. Yani, it would be very damaging for us if we're walking on earth knowing that's in Allah forgave. But it's, it looms over your head, it's a good sign. Not too much though, I'll explain. Um, if, if I were ever confident that Allah forgave this sin, I would get arrogant. And the believer always see the sin looming on top of him. Umar radiallahu anhu, after the, the signing of the treaty of Hudaybiyah, he just was upset because the treaty was so unfair against the Muslims. And he just went to the Prophet and he said, Alasta Rasulullah, aren't you the Prophet of Allah? Aren't we upon the haqq and they're upon falsehood? Then why should we accept the humiliation in our deen? Then he went to Abu Bakr asked the same question. That's all he did. He just asked these questions. The Prophet gave him an answer, he stayed quiet. But then Umar said, فَعَمِلْتُ لِذَلِكَ عَمَلًا يعني, He spent years and he spent a long time after that of his life doing good deeds to cover for that sin. What sin? Just asking the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't even argue with him. He just asked him some questions. He didn't like the treaty. But look at how the believer saw his action and for years he's doing good deeds to cover it. So from one angle, it's very good to never for sure know if your sin was forgiven. Now here's the bad side, is when the shaitan comes and tricks you so that you believe that there is no way to the mercy of Allah and you become despondent, meaning you lose hope, right? And that's why Shaykh Ahmad just whispered to me the verse from Surah Az-Zumar. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say to my servants, who have an israf is when you overdo excess way too much. So asrafu ala fusim, they've committed so many sins that these sins have, bur have become burdensome, burdensome upon them. What is interesting though, is that the, some of the mufassirin said this verse is not even speaking to Muslims. One more time. Some of the mufassirin said this verse is not speaking to Muslims who make tawbah and pray five times a day. They said this verse, some of the Mufassirin said this verse is speaking to non-Muslims. Can you imagine if the verse is telling non-Muslims, don't think that your sins are so many that you lose hope in the mercy of Allah Azawajal. Allah forgives all sins. So if that's the case, then there's no way for the shaitan to make us lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala. The third one. The third one, right? The third question. Sign that our repentance is accepted by Allah. The sign that a person's repentance is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's for you, Shaykh. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is in general. In general. In, 
um, I, I can't remember at this moment anything very specific, but I, I just remember the general things that, that the scholars mentioned, like, uh, like for example, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes your activities. Yani, this person used to be involved with people who do this and that, and, and, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced what busies him. Now he's not busied with drugs and alcohol and, and thieves and murders. Now he's busied with the masjid and memorization of Quran. So I can only recall the general things where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes your state and your affairs. It's a sign that so someone was a murderer and now he's in the masjid and an imam and all that. That's a sign Allah has really accepted his tawbah and his repentance. And that's why he moved to this better, uh, better environment. But these are just very general ones. I don't recall anything more specific. Can you think of something? I'll just say I actually don't uh, recall anything, but as the Sheikh mentioned with regards to the answer to the last question, how he said it's a double-sided coin, in the first is that you don't ever really know, and we should be comfortable with that, okay with that, why? Ibn Qayyim, he says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires goodness for a person, he'll make their sins in front of their eyes until he enters them into paradise. The reason why you always, when you, when you don't know that, not knowing, what does that make you constantly do? It, it makes you constantly repent for that sin. It makes you constantly seek Allah's forgiveness for it. And then it becomes like a garment. If you have a stain on your garment and you continue to wash it, you continue to wash it, you continue to give it attention, what will eventually happen? Eventually, inshallah, it'll become clean. And so it's not something that you just repent from once and you're like, okay, I'm done from that. It's something that, and that's what you'll see in, with the Sahaba. You see Umar ibn Khattab, again, always being cognizant of that particular action that he did with Rasulullah sallallahu and seeking forgiveness from it, not just once, but over a lifetime. Great. Also, if the sisters have any questions. So you bring up a very interesting issue, which is people, they, you know, you look at, for example, the issue of non-Muslims, and from the outside, it looks like they're, when they accept Islam and they've lived a life of, you know, uh, disobedience and transgression and he, uh, a hedonistic life, you feel like they've enjoyed so many of the pleasures that are haram, and then now they're entering into Islam. Uh, it's almost like kind of like a win-win, right? They got to enjoy the dunya to the max and then they come and they accept Islam. But in reality, uh, in reality what we, we do learn, as you mentioned with, in conversation with them, is that it wasn't really a win-win because they were in fact, because if, if life was so fantastic and so great and all of that, then they wouldn't have been searching for Islam in the first place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةٌ ضَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance in reality, they'll have a very constricted life. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's almost like suffocation. And I can relate to this very much because, you know, growing up uh, and experiencing kind of growing up in, in the Western world and then growing up in, in the Eastern world, people look at the people in the West and they're, you know, they're watching the, the music videos of the, of the people having a, a great time in the nightclub and stuff like that. And they're like, wow, this is like amazing. But then when you're actually living here, you see the ramifications of that night over uh, a lifetime. 
Like what happens? What happens is people, you know, experience incredible pain because of that lifestyle, whether it's the child who grows up without a father, never knowing who their father is, whether it's society at large and the way that, you know, this type of lifestyle affects households and communities and things like that. And you say, Alhamdulillah for Islam, right? Um, and so uh, that particular concept, I think is very, very true that a person who is living outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person lives within what Allah has legislated, they are actually living the happiest life that is available in this dunya. Allah ta'ala. Sister? Yes, Sister. Sister, you have a question? So you know something very, very interesting? I heard this, um, so the question is, what if you're like currently immersed in a sin, right? Uh, what if you have a guy, for example, who's dating a girl and you're telling him make dope and he's like, I don't want to right now, right? I, I, I'm very much enjoying that particular experience. Someone who's, who has something that they might even be addicted to and they will make dua for, to be forgiven from every sin and to stop every sin except for that one sin that they're actually currently enjoying. So um, something that I actually heard beautifully from Sheikh Walid, and when I say Sheikh Walid, I mean Sheikh Walid Basuni, our Sheikh in uh, Clear Lake. But he was, someone had discussed with him the issue of a person who's immersed in a sin, and they had actually, that person had asked someone to make dua for them, and he said, make dua for me to kind of stop all of my sins, except for one, okay? Like what if, you ha what if I actually love this particular sin? What then? And so the Sheikh said, there's actually a beautiful dua for this that we should teach each other to make. And that is, Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman wa zayinuhu fi qulubina. Oh Allah, make faith beloved to us and adorn it in our hearts. Wa karrih ilayna al-kufra wa al-fusuqa wa al-isyan. And make hated for us disbelief and transgression and disobedience. And make us of our rashidin, make us of the righteous, make us of the rightly guided. Because this person who's immersed in sin, they're addicted to sin, at the end of the day, it's their heart. And so who's the one who controls hearts? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what you do is you're asking Allah, you're saying, Oh Allah, transform the state of my heart. Make me love faith and make me hate disobedience. Make me hate this very sin that I'm currently in love with. Allah. I hope that answers your question, by the way. Uh, I, I, I also heard you say that can someone repent as they're doing this sin? They, they can't give it up, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know of anyone who would tell you you can't repent. Yani, let's say someone's a smoker. They know they can't give it up. They're chemically addicted to it. But as a good believer, should they not say Astaghfirullah after each cigarette? Or only when they quit and get the gum and get the patch and then they say Astaghfirullah. As a good believer, what do you think? Every time. Every time. Every time. Wallahi, just finish it, kida. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Even though, okay, I didn't repent. I didn't give up. And I'm, I know I'm going to smoke one in another, I don't know how many minutes. But still, we, this is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to save all these and then repent when I quit finally. Yeah? Wallahu ta'ala. Beautiful, beautiful, exactly. You heard that, yeah? Same sin is offered to you. He said, when the same sin is offered to you later on, and you reject it, you turn it down, you have no interest in it. That's a sign of, of repentance for sure, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's a sign yeah. the Sheikh spoke about that, that you don't return to it. Yeah? yeah? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. beautiful. Wow. Very good. No, no. Okay. No, Probably if you can 
spill a little bit the secret probably before the class next week from all the, the name of uh, Allah, the several of them that we really want to implement it in our life. For instance, how can, what is the practical measure that we can do in order for us to adopt one problem to the name of Allah like al Dapur? For always forgive Allah uh, to the people who always speak. You know, sometimes we cannot stand it uh, to the, you know, to the things that uh, the other people have done to us. And the second one probably uh, like Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman el Gafur. What is the practical measure that we can do? Even though probably most of us try to do it, but sometimes we fail uh, many, many times. Is there any practical measure that we can a little bit share with us? Jazakallah khair. Uh, so there is, a, a, so the question is what are the practical methods with regards to accessing these names? Sorry. Yeah. What, are, what is the practice, practical method of accessing these names? Number one, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَ فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Allah says to Allah belong the most beautiful names, so call upon Him by these names. And so number one, the first very practical thing, and in fact this is what Allah tells us after telling us that He has these beautiful names, is He says call upon Him by these names. And so as I am making dua, that I am thinking about what name of Allah is appropriate for this dua that I'm making. And so if I'm asking Allah for something with regards to risk, that I use the name Ar-Razzaq. If I am asking Allah by something with regards to His generosity and benevolence, then I say Al-Kareem. If I'm asking Allah for safety and security, that I say Al-Mu'min. And it goes on like that. Mm. So thinking about the names, and I, I think that's uh, something that, you know, if one of us knew, for example, tomorrow we had a meeting with the mayor of Houston, we would actually sit and think a little bit before we would go and sit down in their presence. And so, contemplating about the du'as that we make, that we don't just make our du'as something that just whatever comes, I understand that it can be from the heart and comes from the top of the head, but also thinking about preparing the du'as that we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What statements are we going to make to Allah? What things are we going to ask from Allah in your sujood, in your um, moments with Allah? So that's number one. Number two, there's a beautiful concept. It's not a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, but the scholars have mentioned it many times, and that is, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ That you adorn yourself with the characteristics of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who, who carry these characteristics that He has. And so, Allah is knowledgeable, He loves the knowledgeable. Allah is powerful, He loves the strong believer. Allah is generous, He loves the generous. And so when you're taught Allah is merciful, He loves the merciful. And so all of these attributes, and there are very few of those names that, you know, are not uh, supposed to be manifested in human beings, or they're not, they're not uh, perfect in their manifestation. But the, by and large, all of these attributes, Allah loves when they're manifested in human beings. And so if you want to have mercy, Allah to have mercy on you, have mercy on other people. If you want Allah to forgive you, then go and forgive somebody. And there are many hadith to that effect. The Prophet وسلم, says, Man la yarham, la yarham. Whoever does not show mercy will not experience mercy. The Prophet وسلم, gave the example of a person who he was a merchant. And this man he used to send his debt collectors out. And you know, he'd loan people money. And then he would send out people to collect the money that was owed to him. And he said, he would send to them, uh, the debt collectors and he would say, if you found anybody who can't pay it back, then forgive them. May Allah forgive us. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah forgave him. Right? Maybe you have $200 that somebody's owed you since 1995. You're still holding it over their head. You know, forgive them. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. And so interacting with those names in that way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Yeah, I have a question actually. When when does the construction for the masjid begin? So. Maybe a uh, brother. Eka, can you? Uh, make the The Sheikh and I are at your service. Whatever you need, let us know, inshallah.
Uh, my question is, uh, how do you say hello in Indonesian? One more time slowly. Okay, salam alaikum, I got. But you know, you reminded me. I was in Minneapolis one time, and we asked the Somali community. So I was in a, I was in a little store, and this kid, this, I see this small Somali kid, and I say, salam alaikum to him, and he says, wa alaikum salam, and then he starts speaking to me in Somali, and I say, I don't speak Somali. And then his mother, she notices the conversation with a stranger, so she pulls him to the side, and she said, he said he doesn't speak Somali. He's like, what do you mean? He was speaking Somali. He said, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> so I, was, uh, I understand the universal way to say hello, but I, I was seeking a more local version. So what do we say? Apa kabar. Apa kabar. Kabar, like Apa. kabar. Apa. Yeah. Apa kabar. Malaysia is not that. Malaysia is salamat datang. Salamat datang. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Apa? Apa kabar. Kabar. You answer kabar by Alhamdulillah. Okay, let me just get the first one down. <laughs> and then next time, inshallah, I'll get the answer. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much. 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 Th